called central force motion. Uh, it's the dynamics that goes into orbital mechanics, why, uh, why things go in the orbits that they do. And it's because the, there's always a force directed toward a center, central point, which we looked at uh, when we looked at circular motion and the like, but uh, we really didn't take that much beyond uh, circular motion, maybe with a little bit of acceleration. We didn't look into all the possibilities of what that, that business can do. So let me lay out a, just a little bit of a background reminder. Uh, gravitational force between two masses is an attractive force, of course, and it's a situation where it's equal and opposite forces. And given uh, Newton's law of gravitation, you probably remember that it's. Uh, also a factor of the distance squared between the two objects. And then that G, the universal gravitational constant, um, I think it's called 673, very small. Um, the the uh, gravitational force is not a very big one. It's the, the weakest of the fundamental forces. Um, and to make everything work, it's got kind of odd units. Uh, it's uh, experimentally determined. I don't know that anybody's ever been able to derive that from empirical um, empirical work. It's, it's uh, possible, I guess. So uh, if we take that to be then, um, let's let M2 be uh, maybe the mass of the Earth, and then if M1 is U, for example, then the weight is G M1 M E, and then D squared becomes the radius of the Earth, the distance from the center. Now this is all assuming, remember, that the uh, Earth is a uniform homogeneous sphere, which it isn't quite. So a lot of this is <coughs> approximate, uh, but it does lead to then, if you put in uh, the values, cancel the M1, put in the values that are just right out of the book, you do get something about like the uh, <coughs> strength of the gravitational <coughs> field that we use for all of our classes. Um, and then the mass of the Earth, and we'll be using these numbers 5, 9, 7, 6, those numbers you get the gravitational acceleration that we're so used to for what we do. It comes out actually a little bit higher. Um, but it comes out very close to what we use, so, so the numbers are all good. Um, at locations above the Earth's surface, which is what we need to look at when we're talking about orbital mechanics, then the acceleration itself is uh, reduced a little bit because you're getting farther from the Earth and it turns out that it's as the square of the ratio 
where R then is the distance from the Earth center, which then would be, of course, the radius of the Earth plus the height of the, uh, of the, the distance above the surface, I guess, if you will. So maybe we'll call that H. So uh, we can start looking at, at orbits at different heights and different speeds that go into them. All right, that's Physics 2 stuff, I believe, right? You did uh, uh, Chapter 9 in Physics 2. Did you do anything with orbital mechanics? A little bit. Just, uh, well, you probably didn't do what we're going to go through, so, because uh, we're going to beef it up a little bit. All right, so that's, that's just a bit of a reminder of the background. Now, the setup that we're going to use, see the Earth. The Earth is blue, of course. We call it the blue marble. But it is spring, so we need to we need to draw in. There's Florida, all the people coming back from Florida. Now that the weather's nice. So that's, that's pretty darn realistic. That just that looks like a, a picture from the space station or something. Um, so we're going to start <coughs> things from. a point where our satellite, whatever it might be, will have a velocity v0 at a particular point where the velocity is perpendicular to the line connecting the two, and so we'll call that our, our fundamental distance, r0. And then the path of the satellite, which may or may not be circular, may or may not be elliptical. We'll look at all those possibilities as we go here. Then the uh, rest of the definitions we need is uh, the angle will be taken from this initial spot where the two are perpendicular, because after that, they're not quite <coughs> perpendicular anymore. Uh, if the velocity and the line joining the object in the center are always perpendicular, then you can only get circular motion. Uh, and we have to allow for the possibility of other kinds of <coughs> orbits, as we'll see once we get all the way through it, as you probably remember from some of what you set up in uh, in physics too. All right, so that's that's the basis for for our setup for what we're going to do. And uh, oh no, we need a little bit more, just a little bit more, because we do have then a need for a <coughs> coordinate system. So we'll use polar coordinates where. We have a radial component straight out and a tangential component in the direction of motion. Oh, that was not, not tangential. For polar coordinates, we use P theta there. We're not going to have those long. Uh, we're going to break it in the two different directions in a second anyway. Okay, so that's our setup using polar coordinates. So we'll need to pull a little bit of that out of our memory as well. So we sum the forces in the R direction, uh, the radius <coughs> direction. Well, that is the gravitational acceleration. So that's a minus because it's the force is directed towards the center, away uh, in the opposite direction of our radial direction. And so we have the, the original uh, the, the piece. That's just essentially the weight at places other than the Earth's surface. If we were at the Earth's surface, this would be RE over RE. That would cancel. We just have MG. And the minus just means it's directed opposite to our R direction. <coughs> but if you remember our um, radial component of the acceleration, we 
established this uh, the day we did polar coordinates. So it should look a little bit familiar. And we did that, uh, we, that all, a lot of this came about, if you remember, we also had to have the time rate of change of the unit vectors themselves. And that, a lot of that led to uh, the pieces that we have here, if you remember. Because uh, unlike XY coordinates, we have changing unit vectors in uh, polar coordinate when we're doing this kind of motion. And then in the theta direction, we have no forces in the theta direction, so that side is just zero. And then the other side is the acceleration component in the theta direction that we also established on that day a couple months ago when we did the, uh, did the <coughs> uh, polar coordinates. Plus 2r dot theta dot. We've got to be real careful. We can't lose any dots. Okay. Right. Um, in the book, just for reference sake, this is uh, equation 214. Um, and that's back when we did it. We did that in uh, probably February or so. All right, in the second part, though, we can simplify a little bit in that, uh, well, actually, for both of them, notice the masses cancel all through. The mass of this object does not matter, does not have anything to do, any bearing on what the uh, orbit will be. And so the second part then can simplify to... Um, 1 over r times the time rate of change of r squared theta dot. And that r squared theta dot uh, should also look a little bit familiar. So that all equals 0. <coughs> all right. So that in itself, um, I don't think there's much new here other than we're allowing for the fact that gravity the gravitational field strength diminishes as we get uh, above the Earth's surface a significant distance. All right. Since this business equals zero, then this piece right here must be a constant. So r squared theta dot must itself be a constant. But we also know that uh, the velocity in the theta direction is r omega. And omega is theta dot. So we then have, uh, we can put that in here so that we know that r, we take one r, one theta dot out, we know that the r, v theta equals a constant itself. And we can find out precisely what that constant is by going to the initial position where we have v0 and R0 and they will also equal that constant because that's what the product of those two are at that initial position. At the very initial place where a distance R0 away from the center of the Earth, our theta velocity is V0, our initial velocity, and so we know that then to be a constant. <coughs> So we're going to need that several times with, uh, with the remaining. So that's one of the little things we can't lose as we go through this. All right, so the next little step, we're going to take, um, we're going to take this. Let's see. Uh, how should I put it? 
we're going to take all that. So theta dot equals um, that constant r0 v0 over r. Sorry, over r squared. Yeah, we had the square there. So that's just saying that this side equals the constant, and that constant also equals this side. So we just solve the theta dot, because that then we can put in over here on the first equation. So that's our next step. We've got minus g <coughs> over re r quantity squared, then equals r double dot minus r theta dot squared, which is that piece up there. Right, that's combining, combining this little piece here with that piece right there. Oh, R squared on the bottom, yeah. Yeah, we got it. We can't lose any of these things. We're going to be sidetracked for hours. Okay, so we can we can reduce this other side a little bit, just clean things up because we've got a bunch of R's around here, a bunch of squares. R zero squared V zero squared over R cubed then. And that we're going to set aside for a little bit, uh, and we'll come back to it. <coughs> okay. So hang on to that a bit. We got a little more work to do until we come back to that. out of left field, but it comes together in the end. Uh, so we're going to introduce this new quantity, we'll call it u, is just 1 over r. Because we have a lot of 1 over r's over there, so it's going to help us bring some stuff back together, put them together here and there. So now we can work on the, uh, it's too bad I have to erase those equations. I always had those boards that slid up so we could leave them there. But we have that uh, that theta component, uh, so I mean the R component that we're working on. Oh, this one, this one here. So we're, we're working on it more now. We want to work on that R double dot part. So let's see. That's D theta dots, just dr d theta. So at D, so not dr d theta, dr d t. But R is one over U. Introducing our new term there. And so that's minus u squared, sorry, 1 over u squared. Just doing the, the, the derivative of this with respect to time. So just taking that derivative. So that's, uh, that's what the chain rule? Is that right? Uh, but we're not so much interested in how u varies with time, we're much more interested in how u varies with theta. So we want to go to du d theta d theta dt. Because d theta dt we have, and now we're going to see how u varies with theta, which is much more useful to us. And then that is minus r squared theta dot, which is the end part there, du d theta. Okay. Now, uh, Remember, though, that r squared theta dot 
which we have here is equal to that constant, and that constant is also equal to R0, V0. So then we can say that R dot equals minus R0, V0, our initial conditions at the uh, uh, place where we started. That's the R squared theta dot VU theta. And that is going to be equation number two that we need to, uh, to set aside. We'll bring it back in a, in a minute. All right, so there's, there's now we've got uh, uh, R dot, which is the first step here. We can do now R theta dot, sorry, R double dot. which is that piece right there that we just did. So this is d dt of minus r0 v0. Now remember, those are constants. Those are not variables. Those are constant values. That's where we started our uh, problem. So this just... Uh, then means we need to take the chain rule on this part, the minus r0, v0 comes out, and we have ddt of du d theta, which is d theta dt, d d theta of du d theta. That's a little, the little bit of the chain rule in there. But we can clean that up a little bit too. Just front part, just constant. Theta dot for that part. And then d squared u d theta squared. So that's our double dot. Oh wait, we can do even a little bit more with it. Because... We've got uh, we've got we've got this piece here that we can uh, use here because we have r zero v zero as part of it, then the r square, uh, and then uh, the theta dot part. Is that what we want? Let's see. Yeah. So then this becomes, remember this is R double dot, this becomes minus R U V R zero V zero squared. Uh, we're just putting in theta dot for that. That piece over there is theta dot. We're just putting that in so that squares that term. We've got R squared on the bottom, which is U squared. And then the d squared u d theta squared is untouched. So all I did was took this piece here for theta dot and put it in there for theta dot. And now we can put <coughs> that piece, remember this is r double dot, we can put that piece in right there. So maybe I'll just continue that right below it. We can put that R double dot in there. So that's minus R0, V0 quantity squared, U squared. d squared u d theta squared. <coughs> Minus uh, the part we have on the back there. Minus r0 v0 quantity squared over 
R cubed. That came from taking this and putting in the R double dot we just uh, came up with. We just came up with R double dot here. That's what that string is. And so now I've just put it in there. There we go. That explains it. Wait, you put the cancellation. Yeah. Oh, it's going to it's going to simplify. Greatly, even though checking the uh, checking the algebra can take hours. So, uh, well, at least it did me. So there's a couple places where I'm going to kind of wave my hands and saying simplifying gives, and then you go home because you have hours and you check that. <coughs> All right. So let's see. Where are we now? Okay, so we've we've got this whole business here. Let's uh, all put it up here. We've got uh, minus g. I'm just rewriting that. R e over r quantity squared equals minus r zero v zero quantity squared u squared squared u v theta squared minus that constant squared. Remember r0, zero, v0 zero is a constant over r cubed. Alright, and here's one of the places where I'm going to say it simplifies to and then you go home, make a pot of coffee, and spend three hours checking this like I did yesterday. <clears throat> Unless you're faster at this stuff than I am. This simplifies to g over quantity re r0 v0 squared. So that's just a matter of dividing through by the minus r0 v0 squared, which remember is a constant which makes all of this stuff on this side a constant <coughs> equals d squared u d theta squared plus u squared. Okay, that looks good. No minus signs missing, no squares missing. We're okay. And you guys are all in diffy q, right? So you've got this solved already. Isn't it? This is just u? Yeah, because you got r cubed and you're left by, which is u cubed. You're left yeah. by u squared. Oh, yeah, just u. It is. It's right there in front of me. Yeah. It was u squared, but we took one of the 1 over r squared and used that. All right. So this has solution, which I'm sure you've all done already in your heads. A sine theta plus b sine, b cosine theta, plus that quantity on that side. Which is a constant, remember. Alright, and so to find out what those constants are, a and b, We need to look at initial conditions. So at theta equals zero degrees, we have u equals one over r zero. So that whole side has to equal one over r zero. Um, what the, well that that part then gives us. Uh, that A equals zero. If I got the right piece, that is zero. Yeah. And we know that V are the velocity in the radial direction 
At this point, remember, it was perpendicular to the radial direction itself. So that is itself zero. And so we need to uh, erase the second, the second equation. I've got one equation there. The second equation I needed, remember, was r dot the r dt equals minus r zero v. I'm just writing down the second one that I had to erase. Okay, so that means then, uh, see, that's what we've got right here, so that all equals zero, which means du d theta equals zero. So du d theta is zero at the same time spot. So now we can finish finish that because um, that gives us b, the second constant in the uh, solution to the differential equation, is one over r zero minus g quantity r e over r zero v zero squared. So that gives us the full solution to the differential equation. We're getting down to the meat of it. I'm rolling your eyes and move down. And the solution becomes. <coughs> Put all those things in, and this, this, uh, I couldn't derive directly, but I could take it, put in what I've got here, and come back to this. So maybe you can derive it directly when you put this in. I couldn't, but maybe you can. Where we take the constant terms and combine them all into this one piece called the eccentricity, which is a term you probably remember. So it's r0, v0 squared, not quantity squared, over r e minus 1. And this, is, this is the eccentricity. Did you talk about that in physics too? A little bit. Okay. It gives what it gives us is the orbital shape, depending upon what its value is. If the eccentricity is uh, zero, then it's a circular orbit. And if you put it in there as one you get uh, essentially all the way back, you get a uniform circular motion. If it's between 0 and 1, then we get an elliptical orbit, ellipse. If it is 1, we get a parabolic orbit, And then if it's greater than one, we get a hyperbolic orbit. And if you uh, remember your conic sections, you'll know the, the difference between those. Uh, 
squared? No, R naught is not squared. See, I told you to simplify greatly. It's just going to take you uh, a couple hours to prove that it does. But like I said, the easiest way, I, or the way I finally did it, is I just took this, put it back in there, and then I can back out the uh, solution to the differential equation. I couldn't do it directly from the differential equation. All right, the most interesting orbits are the elliptical ones. The parabolic ones are very useful. They use that uh, when they slingshot satellites past other bodies like Mars or something to give them some, uh, pick up some speed. So here's the, the Earth with a nice elliptical orbit. I'll make it a little bit bigger. With the uh, Earth at one focus of the ellipse, which if you remember was one of uh, Kepler's laws, Kepler's uh, first law, I believe. All right, so we have a, a couple things we need to define here. This, this distance, remember, was our original R0. That was our initial point. This point here of closest approach is called the perigee. <coughs> point of closest approach. It's also the point of highest velocity. This is the apogee, the point farthest away, and then the axes, the major axes. That distance uh, we'll call 2A. So uh, A is just a semi-major axis. And then across here, across the uh, minor axis is B. So B is the semi, B itself is the semi-major axis. All right, remember this assumes uniform masses or at least we're far enough away from the Earth it can be taken as uniform mass. No other forces, so we don't have perturbation effects from other planets. And of course it's far enough that there's no uh, drag. And assuming too that this mass is fixed in space. Uh, if we want to do it in an external frame of reference, we have to add in other effects that uh, we have to play with. All right, so the last little bit is the orbital period itself. And this, uh, this you can get from uh, um, playing further with the equations. And I think you've had enough algebra for now. So where is it? There it is. 2 pi a to the 3 halves. Remember, a is the semi-major axis over R B square root of G. And if you move that around a little bit, you'll see that that's Kepler's third law. Get those 
initial conditions from, from which all this stuff came by launching such that right when it reaches a particular point it then has that velocity and uh, the orbit itself is a ballistic orbit meaning it's non-powered so this would be the place where you want to have burnout where the the rockets themselves are uh, out of fuel and usually jettisoned. You've seen those pictures uh, as they do that with the space shuttle. So we'll give a couple values to this and then uh, figure a couple things and then we're done. So we'll take a, a speed at that point, the speed at burnout of 30, just under 37,000 kilometers per hour and an altitude of 500 kilometers. And we'll take it to find a couple things. Find the maximum altitude, which of course is at this point over here at Apogee. and also find the orbital period. It's when we can expect it to come back into view and closest approach uh, later. Okay, first thing we can do is even check that it is an elliptical orbit. So calculate the eccentricity Make sure that it's in those bounds for an elliptical orbit, which it will be, since that's what, uh, that's what I was talking about here. <clears throat> um, Kepler's second law, if you remember, is equal areas and equal time. So we could uh, also calculate the rate at which areas are swept out and prove that, but uh, mental gymnastics get to be even more severe. So check the eccentricity. Remember it's R0, V0 squared, which you are given. G is 9.81. We came up with something close to 9.82 the numbers before, but uh, that was, remember, uh, not using actual measurements like the 9.81 is minus 1. So check that eccentricity. Make sure it is an elliptical orbit. And then use the solution that we came up with a little bit ago and find the maximum altitude using that eccentricity. Alright, so check those and then that'll give you A because that's related to this maximum altitude and then you can find the uh, orbital period using uh, Kepler's third law there. Elliptical orbits with the main body at one focus is Kepler's first law. Second law is equal areas and equal times, and then the third law is the square of the period is directly proportional to the cube of the uh, semi major axis. Which I believe Kepler came up with first by pure observation of orbital times and positions. 
You know the radius of the top of your head. I do, which I'll sell you for a small price. Yeah, these are numbers in the book. Um, six three seven. Use sixty three seventy kilometers. What else do you, you got? All the other pieces. So after that, just make sure your units work. center at any one particular point. And then the theta is the angle made from uh, perigee. Because only at perigee and apogee are the velocities perpendicular to the radius. And uh, it's moving much slower at apogee than it is at perigee. Essentially, after apogee, it falls towards the earth and falls around it. So for R naught, we should just have that where plus the radius of the earth. No, R naught is the radius of the earth plus the height of the orbit, <coughs> which is the altitude, the 500 kilometers. So R, R equals. Uh, radius of the Earth plus height of the orbit. Um, and this, this is a bit different than the way the book did it. I thought the, the way the book did it wasn't very, very uh, easily followed. Watching your units so. because yeah. you've got kilometers per hour <coughs> and kilometers. I, just um, it to to so I guess you could leave it in kilometers, I guess. Uh, now, a G is in meters, so it's easier to put everything in meters and seconds. And then uh, I get 083813. Travis just confirmed too. Anybody else? Yes. This is the 500 plus the uh, plus the uh, height 500. Uh, the 500 plus the radius of the Earth. find out maximum altitude, remember you've got to take the uh, radius of the earth out of that. Did you get it positive this time? Did you you it well. The units even work on this beast over here. interest may be more elliptical the orbit.
And at maximum altitude, you're going to have to put in theta equals uh, 180. 180 degrees. Should the rest of it work? You can use either one, it just depends on how your calculator is set. Yeah, it's set degrees. So. Yeah, then you want to you want to fix that. You can see how how the freehand ellipses look. Just use, that's pretty good. Uh, we'll just use a 90 for theta? Um, or zero? No, theta for the maximum altitude would be all the way over here, 180 degrees. 180. Yep. In the book, David, I didn't I write this down. Uh, it's the book somewhere. I don't remember, I didn't take note of it, I guess. It's uh, probably somewhere near the end of uh, chapter three, maybe? What was chapter three? Not of particles. Checking the index in the back for orbit, uh, orbits. Okay. Nope. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, no. That's right. That's work energy. Well, maybe here, special applications. Um, yeah, central force motion right there. Got some of the pieces then, but not only this problem, but the class, the bed. What do you got? Okay, you got that. Now that you've got the eccentricity, you can put it in here. R0 is uh, the altitude plus the radius of the Earth, is R0, so you can then put in the eccentricity solve for R at 180 degrees, that'll give you the, the that'll give you the full distance from the center of the Earth. So you take out the uh, uh, radius of the Earth and then you'll have uh, the original R0 plus the uh, radius you just calculated. The two of those together is 2A. So you can solve for R max using theta equals 180 degrees. And then R max plus R zero is 2A. Still not getting the eccentricity? Okay, let's, uh, let's make a little space and try that. Okay, so R0 is the radius of the Earth plus the altitude. I see my problem. What was it? Oh, yeah. You square the velocity, but not the tool. Just just the velocity. <coughs> and as long as your units are all in the same. Let's just use them. Yeah. Okay. 
got a max height of 60,332 kilometers. 60,000 what? 332, 333. Uh, I, I had 6,200, so it may just be round off. Uh, you had 60,200? Yeah, as the height. Mm -hmm. You had the maximum radius as 66,702. Yeah, and then you have to take the radius of the Earth out of that mm -hmm. and get the maximum altitude. Well, that's probably good. Close enough, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, <coughs> it depends, I guess. There's probably some round off. So, I got an R max of 66.6 times 10 to the 6 <coughs> meters. Somebody else just said they got that? Okay. So the altitude then, and take the radius of the Earth off of that, is 60,200 kilometers. So that's maximum R, maximum H. Sixty thousand two hundred kilometers, and then two A is R zero plus R max. It's two A, and then that A is what goes in here. And uh, R E race years must be in meters for that to work. Radius of the Earth off of R max. Oh, okay. yeah, that equals R max minus R E. Uh, you had you have this in meters. Mm -hmm. Meters. Per, that's of course nine point eight one. And uh, let's then check what you have for A. Shouldn't take the, the time down to to what are you at? Fourteen hours? Nineteen point five. Nineteen point five hours? Nineteen point seven. Wow, oh, it really makes a big effect. Because with the thirty-three in here, instead of thirty-six, 
I had 42 hours. So it has a huge, huge effect, I guess, because it rehabs. Anyway, so you get an orbital period of, you said, what, 19 hours? 19.5. 19.5 hours. Okay, I was at the end of four hours of putting all this together, so you only got you only had to go an hour. So that's it. Any questions about that? Or anything else in the term for next week? Remember, next week will just be the last, what, the last three chapters? So the last two. So there'll be some, some bit on the relative. Oh, I know, Joey's up in Clarkson. Campus visit. That's what Joey is. Okay, so some relative velocity. Remember, we use the method of instant center. It's just one way to do it. You don't have to do it that way. I have two. If, I, if you have two A in here, you get forty-two. Hmm. Well, you do it for four hours to see if you. <coughs> because that was after all the double checking all of the uh, algebra in there. down. Oh, uh, no. Wrote down, eh?